great pleasure to be among a panel of Paul States, um, people who, despite of the serious risk, are still uh, speaking out and resisting. Um, so today I want to briefly share some of my experience as an ex-Muslim here in the UK. Um, the, the hopes and expectations I came with and the reality I faced on ground as, as an ex-Muslim. Um, so I came to the UK in 2010 and uh, I was pushed by many social and political complications back in Sudan. Um, on top was the religious, strict religious culture and the Sharia law. Um, so just going to the few first months I, 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 um, I came here to the UK, I remember I was surprised, and maybe to some extent I was shocked, to know about the huge amount of conservative Islamic culture and Islamism generally in the UK. Um, so the 85 Sharia courts, they're supposed to rule under the Arbitration Act, but in reality, they're parallel, mini parallel systems um, to the, to the um, um, English law. And um, forced marriage, huge culture of forced marriage. In a way, it's, it's just protected under the umbrella of culture, in a way. Um, gender segregation, and then it's also supported by the national body, the UK universities. Um, one of the weirdest, these are just the ones that came to my mind, but there's such a long list of um, things I was shocked about. But the burqa was one of the weirdest things, because those of us who come from an Islamic background know that the, the, the purpose of the burqa, and this is something that everyone will tell you, people who wear it, people who are pro it, the purpose of it is to control women. So it's, it's meant to control the sex and sexuality of women because they're seen as fitna, as, as um, sexual objects that cause disobedience and kais in the community. People aren't, don't tiptoe around that, people say it. People, generally, women believe, those who wear it believe that they're, they're, meant, they're supposed to be controlled. And suddenly, all this is dismissed. And here in the UK, it's being debated on the choice. I have no idea how it came to be debated on the choice. But I think if, if this is the logic they're using, I think we should fear that at some point we'll bring in uh, the slavery debate back. People have the choice to be oppressed. If they choose to be oppressed, you know, if they're happy, if they consciously take the, the choice of being slaves, then this is their right, and we should respect that. <laughs> so all this, and then um, there's the serious aggressive attitude toward apostates. Um, and I'm glad that Magdalene uh, explained um, what, what apostate, apostasy entails. So um, it could be people who criticize Islam, criticize the Prophet, criticize the Quran, um, show sort of a, a different behavior from the mainstream um, Islamic culture. And this includes people who renounce it and people who are still Muslims, liberal, progressive Muslims, just don't adopt the mainstream uh, version. So um, aggr an aggressive attitude toward those, um, verbally and physically, um, uh, they get, they experience verbal and physical um, harms and attacks, and, and and we have a number of cases, a number of cases to to um, to support this. So of course we know that the Charlie Hebdo attacks, we're all aware of that, and how just mocking a little cartoon caused such a huge problem. We have the stress that Madjid Nawaz received because of his because of tweeting Jesus and and the Jesus and Moon cartoon. We have the threats that um, Tom Holland had received because of his documentary, The Untold Story About Islam. Um, we, th those who have attended the, the conference last year, last October, know that the, the venue have received a lot of threats and, and there were serious issues about the safety of people attending. Um, those who are attending this conference know that you were just given the address at the, at the last days because of security issues as well. Um, so I myself, I've received, I've received lots of stress as well for doing an interview criticizing Sharia, the Sharia courts in the UK, and the campaign, I'll say, I'll call it the hate campaign, was organized by a Lib Dem member who was until recently a councillor, and the Lib Dems were just completely defensive and dismissed the case, blaming me for what I did. A typical response. Um, we've also seen recently with the Charlie Hebdo attack. Um, well, we don't agree with this, and it was bad, but, you know, what would you have expected if you're criticizing Islam? You shouldn't have provoked. Um, so this sort of attitude. 
In, um, in 2011, policy, the Policy Exchange uh, Organization published, investigated the perception of um, Muslims' communities toward the death penalty. And 34% of those aged between 16 to 24, so more than a third of the young generation, believe that apostates should be killed. This is in the UK. We're not speaking about elsewhere, here in the UK. And this is quite scary. This is scary. These are children who've been born and brought up here. Um, and it's, it's surprisingly, or interestingly, um, unlike their parents, par their parents were more liberal, more open um, about, um, about other groups, and, and more inclusive in a way. So the main question here is, why is this happening? Um, and from, from my own experience, from my observations, I think there are three main factors that are influencing this. The first is the cowardness of the left and liberals. And whenever I speak, I cannot, I cannot be angry enough. I cannot stop ranting about how the liberals and the left are so coward. They're tiptoeing around things. Very disappointing response. They never confront it. And they're just justifying, being ap apologetic. Um, you know, fearing, fearing to be called Islamophobes, racist. And um, yeah, basically just justifying this attitude and staying, staying backward. Um, and this, this creates the lack of a rational group to actually address people's fear, uh, the real fear that everyone is fear, feeling, creates a niche that at the end is filled, out, filled in by the, by the far right. And these are now, they, these are the loudest voice out there criticizing and addressing people's fear, but obviously with lots of bigotry and lots of racism, blaming Muslims and immigrants for everything. So the liberals on the left are not only hopeless in addressing the issue, they're also guarding these attitudes by, by, by calling everyone else uh, a racist. In other words, they're siding with the Islamists, they're doing exactly what, they're, what, what the Islamists are doing. So that's, that's factor number one. The second factor, I think, is the, media's, is the media bias toward Islamists. And it's doing it in two ways. The first is the misrepresentation of the liberal voices. For a reason, whenever there's a discussion or a debate show, the only voices we, the only, the only people who are invited are the, are the extremists or the conservative voices. And uh, when you think about it from a, um, a debate show point of view, it, it does make sense. You know, as a, as a media platform, you do want extreme ideas, you do want to provoke, you do want the heat, you, you want the excitement to go on. And to do that, you need differences. Um, but it seems um, be, because of that, you end up with um, only inviting those who, who hold the conservative views, and you never allow people who, um, who are liberal to, to come and speak out as well. Uh, it also makes sense, because it, it will be boring to have a show where everyone agrees on everything and, you know, being nice and, you know, happy. So, um, that, that's one way. The second way is that it, the media criminalizes free speech by actually censoring things out. I just cannot I can't understand the point of supporting free speech, but then censoring things out. So it, it just doesn't work. And we've seen we've seen the very disappointing, a very disappointing response from the British media after the Charlie Hebdo attack, and how most newspapers and, and a number of channels uh, censored the cartoons out and just put other pictures. Um, so, um, in conclusion, at this point, the media supports extre extremist views. Uh, by allowing them only the platforms and, and um, giving them the opportunity to, to represent everyone else and um, by censoring as well um, everything that's anti-Islam. Uh, the third point and the final one is, is multiculturalism. I think it's been addressed a number of, from a number of speakers uh, as well. So what, what it is supposed, why this is supposed to be um, a positive concept where everyone is happy and um, they're integrate. It's supposed to, sorry, so it's supposed to uh, be a positive concept where um, everyone uh, integrates together to create a bigger society. In, in reality, it's creating many societies competing together and um, uh, it's also boxing people in ethnic and religious cultural boxes and, and, and representing these homogenized groups by certain, uh, by certain people. 
So in the light of the, of the recent Charlie Hebdo attacks as well, a number of people, pro-multiculturalists, brought in the discussion about, um, about how Muslims are discriminated against and how, how they're facing lots of um, uh, racism by the system and by the, generally the institutions. And it's true. A number, of, a number of Muslims are um, being discriminated against, but so are a number of other uh, sectors as well of the community, ex-Muslims, black and ethnic minorities, ex-prisoners, people who come from low-income backgrounds, um, people with disabilities. The system, it's, it's not, the problem is not, so, we cannot solve the problem by singling Muslims out. They're huge and a broader integration problem um, that needs, um, sorting out the social and political um, uh, laws and processes um, in the country. So singling a group and victimizing them does not, does not um, help the problem if it doesn't make it worse. Um, this also applies to whatever comes under communities and, 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 and culture. I, uh, I went to buy a bottle of wine a few weeks ago from a corner shop and, and the first time I came in I picked my wine, I, I had a chat with the, with the cashier and he asked me about my ID, we had a laugh, I left. All this was in English. I went second time with a friend who speaks Arabic, Sudanese friends and we came in, we had a chat in Arabic and we, we picked up the wine, I bought it and before I, I, I got out he told me maybe you should put your wine in your bag, put the bottle of wine in your bag and I asked him why. He said, because you look Muslim and people will think you're a slut. And he used the Arabic, he used the Arabic equivalent of that. So it, it seems the dangerousness of, this, of these policies, multicultural policies, is that they socially foster a culture that justifies people profiling others ethnically and uh, religiously and um, culturally. And um, uh, there's, there's a lot of things to be said. This applies as well to um, faith schools, to mosques, to whatever comes under cultural activities. Um, okay, one minute. <laughs> um, so you got the point. There are lots of things that goes under culture that needs to be monitored. There's things that needs to stop. And um, those with culture, those with culture, and those with religion do deserve a safe place to live in as well. They do deserve equal rights as everyone else. So there's no point of um, uh, making, creating separate rules for them. So in conclusion, my conclusion is that um, I do believe the, the rise of Islamism in, in the UK is part of the rise of the Islamic movement all around, um, power, money, um, and it is influencing what's happening here. But it's also hugely driven by the UK's very own social and political processes and laws. Um, and this is what we need to, to focus on. We need to stop blaming everything happening um, on, on outside or from people who are coming from outside. And we need to start dealing with the leaks and holes in the system. Um, and uh, if, I, if I may leave you with two things, I think would hugely influence and help the problem. Support secular education, because this is, this is where kids um, start to form their, their views about life and, and, and um, appreciate diversity. This is where we need to start working. Um, so support secular education. And the second thing, support apostates. Do support apostates as you can, whatever they are. Um, apostates individuals or organizations working with apostates. And do challenge concepts like murtadda, kafira, zindiga. These are not words. These are hate words associated with action where those called as such. So we need, we need to stop, we need to start challenging these uh, concepts very, very hardly. And do watch the space, because the Council of Ex-Muslims, um, the Center for Secular Space, we are putting together a campaign to um, stop anti-ex-Muslim, anti anti-apostates, because um, it includes the plural Muslims as well, anti-apostates anti hate. Um, so do, do, do watch the space, thank you.